Good evening and welcome to friends, supporters and members of the Midcoast Symphony. Uh, welcome to our third conductor chat. Uh, this is the third of four chats that uh, I'm doing with soloists who've played with Midcoast Symphony over the years. And tonight we welcome Wayne Dumaine and his trumpet from New Jersey. Hello, Wayne. How are you? I'm great. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware, but Wayne does online uh, beer and trumpet presentations, introducing different flavors of beer, and he combines these with little mus musical stories and, uh, and examples. So Wayne, could you tell us a little bit more about your, your beer presentations? Sure. I'm not really sure um, how it started, but just one day I thought, wouldn't it be cool to open a beer? and and get the aromas talk about the aromas and then taste it and talk about what you're getting from the beer and then play a little bit of trumpet at the end of it the name of the show is wayne Dumain's beer course with trumpet and sometimes piano too um so um um so i've done over 50 shows and it's been a lot of fun it's very spontaneous um i try not to study too much before the show because i want to have my own palate and my own taste for it so um shall i do a quick one while we're here well, Wayne, just before you do, I'd, I'd yeah. just like to, uh, you, uh, talking about beer, you may notice here that on my table behind me, I have an array of six beers. And along with Baxter Brewing, who provided these beers, I do want to, first of all, thank uh, our various supporters. Um, and first, I'd like to thank uh, our underwriters, New England Cancer Specialists in the Highlands, our season sponsors, Bath Savings and H.M. Payson and Lamy Wellerhand Shoes, and our concert sponsors, Berman and Simmons Trial Attorneys, L.L. Bean, and Norwalk Savings Bank. And just this evening, we have the special uh, uh, privilege of having these, this wonderful array of beers tasting, so I can join Wayne in his, uh, in his tasting. Awesome. So um, the, the beer I have is super, super special because uh, it's a beer from Bamberg, Germany, and it's a style called Roch beer, which is basically smoke beer. And um, Ochlin Kurla has been brewing these beers since the late 1400s, early 1500s. So it's a really old recipe. And this is the first time I've ever seen it in a can. But uh, but this particular one is a Lent beer. So um, the cool thing about that is um, monks and uh, uh, Catholics, I believe, uh, would fast between Ash Wednesday and Easter. And of course, liquids was part of their fast. It wouldn't ruin the fast. So they would brew beer. So um, this one, it's a 5.9%. And as I mentioned, it's from Bomberg, Germany, where I went many years ago, like 10 years ago, um, and spent a couple of days there. So I'm just gonna go ahead and see, I can already get the, <laughs> it's like barbecue sausage in a beer. And, and there we go. So basically when they say smoke beer, they smoke the malts. And so that's what gives it its color. Look at that. That's beautiful. Wow, that looks copper, amazing. Copper color. And it just feels weird to be um, uh, pouring it from a can. But so, well, yes, can, there it is. Well, I can just oh. about catch the aroma all the way from through the screen. Look, let, uh, I'm what? going to try um, a beer called, I've got these beers from lighter lagers to the most heavy in which is a white Russian stout, but the one I'm going to try is the one in the middle because it kind of represents a lot of uh, main associations. It's called Sea, sea to Summit. It is flavored with spruce tips and uh, blueberries. Oh boy. And it's a lager style beer. <laughs> so let me, let, me, let me open it up and see. Wow. Let's see. No, mm. This is torture. And I've, I've got a wonderful Baxter glass look at that man you're yeah. good to go yeah maine is maine is very has a great uh beer community absolutely incredible portland maine has like maybe over 50 breweries i believe you know yeah. and uh they're all good they're all amazing well cheers them. wayne so cheers so yes. yes so we're getting this the smoked aroma and either you really love smoked beers or you, you, it's the worst thing you've ever tried in your life there's really no in between Oh, this is delicious. I'm getting a spruce. I'm definitely getting spruce. Right. Not too much blueberry, just a little. Yes. I'm getting bacon. <laughs> getting bacon and like 
a barbecue and it's so yeah. strange in a beer and, and but, a, but i just i just want to give a shout out to my very uh, our good friend john tiller with whom i have drunk many blueberry flavored beers oh mm. <clears throat> that is delicious this is the first time i've ever had a beer online right there you go <laughs> So basically on my show at this point, I would talk about the beer when I'm getting from it, and then I would pick up this instrument and play it. So I'm going to play something really quickly. I have no idea what I'm going to play, but see what happens. part about playing oh. trumpet after you have a beer sometimes you belch and the pitch goes down like a full major <laughs> second but that didn't happen today that was really oh good. wait that sounded beautiful i'm, I'm oh just, it's fun yeah i'm just wondering does everybody know what wayne just played <laughs> <laughs> so i'm hearing the snare drum and it, it's the opening of bolero absolutely Wonderful. absolutely great, beautiful. Great, beautiful melody yeah oh my gosh uh wait i met you maybe 30 over 30 years ago. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? It's even longer. I don't even yeah. know. It's, it's... Well, I moved to New York City in 1986 to go to Juilliard. So right. I, was... and, um, I, I started in 1982. I went to okay. Manhattan School. And right. then okay. we, we, did a, we did a tour together in the early 1990s with the Vienna Choir Boys. But at that time, I guess we, you were starting out your freelance career. And I remember you told me about some of your incredible experiences and I, I thought it'd be great for us to hear just a little bit about your formative experiences as a musician and trumpet player yeah well you know everyone has a different childhood and and situation that they grew up in um so but for me like i'm six of nine children and my dad wanted us all to be um concert pianist um and my dad was sort of a tyrant he was abusive and you know and from age six to 18 i practiced piano like two and a half three hours a day Wow. Um, and trumpet was just something that I chose to do when I was eight years old. Um, my dad said one day, we all need to play a secondary instrument. And he wanted me to play oboe. And I didn't even know what oboe was. I was like, no, I don't want to play oboe. Um, but I heard Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie play on the TV. And I was like, that's what I want to do. So my dad got wow. me a trumpet. He got me pan uh, trumpet lessons. And, um, and, you know, music got me through school. Um, we had really good music system. I always looked forward to having band the first period of the day. And once I band was, you know, over, I was good to go for the rest of the day. Um, and, um, it, you know, long road to Juilliard. Um, I didn't really go to Juilliard until my fourth year of college. Um, I had auditioned in high school for uh, Northwestern in Indiana, uh, double majoring trumpet and piano. And I got into both schools, but that summer, uh, the St. Louis Symphony Youth Orchestra, which was founded by Leonard Slacken, we went to Europe, we went to Australia, um, uh, Austria and Germany, and my high school jazz band went to Paris and Switzerland, sort of at the same time, and worked it out that I could do both tours. And that's where I really was like, oh my God, the trumpet's taking me places. I get to see the world if I play this instrument and I'm prepared. And we're playing concerts in Vienna, and the audience is clapping in tandem when we're done. I'm just like, oh, so this is what it's all about, you know? Uh, I come home from that trip. This is my senior year of high school. And my dad says, nope, you're not going to Indiana University. You're going to go to Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. And I was like, what? And you're going to major in piano. And I was still sort of living under the wrath of my father, you know, living in fear. And um, so I went and I didn't like it. My teacher, Ruth Linzinska, this amazing Polish piano, uh, she said to me, well, you know, three, three lessons into being there. She's like, you don't seem very motivated. Maybe you should quit. She was saying that to get me motivated. And I was like, you're right. I quit. Cause I didn't <laughs> want to be, I didn't want to, you know, it was like really strange. So like, I joined a rock band that year and, and I still taken trumpet lessons uh, at, at the school, but I knew when April rolled around, it was time to make a major decision. I didn't want to be there. 
And so I told my dad, listen, I'm done with this. This isn't working. And he hit the roof screaming, hollering. But there was this amazing school in my hometown of St. Louis called the St. Louis Conservatory. And it was basically run by St. Louis Symphony musicians, um, amazing musicians. Henry Lowe on bass would conduct an orchestra. Roland Pandolfi, principal trum uh, French horn, would oh, do wow. rep, rep classes. And we would read through Petrushka. The school would take just the right enough players so that you played everything. And it was two years of me just going to the library, recording all the Mahler symphonies, Brooklyn, really seriously getting into uh, uh, orchestral music. Um, and then... My third year at uh, my third year of being in college, my second year at St. Louis Conservatory, I was studying with Sue Slaughter of the St. Louis Symphony, the first woman uh, principal trumpet player in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. She said, "Hey, there's this guy coming to St. Louis. His name's Wynton Marsalis, um, and I'm going to set up a master class. Would you like to play for him?" I was like, "Sure." It was, this is Wynton's super early years. He had just won the Grammy uh, for the Haydn and the Jazz stuff. And so I played for Wynton. He took me under his wing, and you know, we were talking in his hotel room. And I asked him this one question. I said, Wynton, um, I want to be a successful trumpet player. What, what should I do? And he said, go to New York. Go to Juilliard. Surround yourself with what New York City has to offer. It's the epicenter of everything of the arts, museums, Carnegie Hall. Everyone goes there. Jazz, comedy clubs. Put yourself there. And I'm like, wow, that was the best advice anyone gave me. So what I did was I uh, got a job delivering pizzas and set up my audition. I didn't tell my parents. I was raising money to, to buy a plane ticket. Uh -huh. And so I bought the plane ticket and went to New York. And I remember landing on the plane. I'd never been to New York City. And I fell in love with it right away, just looking at it out of the plane. It's like, this is where I want to be. Um, <laughs> played the audition. You know, a month later, you get the letter in the mail. But when I told my dad I was going to audition for Juilliard, he hit the roof. What do you want? You got everything you need here. Oh, whatever. So I got the letter my acceptance to Juilliard, you're accepted. And he's happy. He's like calling people, my son got into Juilliard. And I'm like, weren't you like just complaining that I shouldn't have done this? Well, it's like that type of atmosphere. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the summer before I go to Juilliard, I went to the Aspen Music Festival. And that's where I actually learned that during the summers, I didn't want to be flipping burgers, delivering pizzas. I wanted to be at a music festival for summers. So I met a lot of people there, Pamela Frank, Per Brevig, all these amazing musicians, people that were my age, people that were mm -hmm. great teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so I go to Juilliard and I'm in this apartment that from, with St. Louis friends of mine that are already at Juilliard. And I was the first one there. And I remember sitting in the window with a pen and pad thinking to myself, what do I have to do to be successful? I'll never forget this. And I don't know what made me do this, but number one was to find a practice room at Juilliard and be there every morning at 7 a.m., no matter what for as long as you're at Juilliard. Um, number two, take every gig you're offered um, and find ways to f just find places to play. And I remember, because back then you didn't have computers where you just go online and find stuff. You had to go to the subway, go to Manhattan School. On the bulletin board there it was, auditions for New York Youth Symphony. Uh, wrote the number down, set up an audition. I auditioned, I got in, and I was playing at Carnegie Hall within uh, a month and a half of being in New York City. It was amazing. Um, number three was I didn't want to be poor. I didn't want, you know, I wanted to make sure I didn't know how I was going to get there. I just knew that that was important to me to be rewarded for whatever I'm doing. Um, uh, number four was to not date, but that didn't last very long. That was, that's, you know, it's truly <laughs> Um, and number five was to always do a summer music festival. Always make sure when school's over, you're not, you're, you're going up somewhere. And I remember the first summer I auditioned for Spoleto Festival and I'm playing Parsifal in Italy and it's a gorgeous small town in Italy. I'm like, yeah. And they got, and we got paid for that. And it was absolutely incredible. And the best thing about summer festivals is that I still have some of the greatest friends from those, from those music festivals. Um, and then like my second year at Juilliard, uh, there was a French horn player who walked up to me one day after rehearsal, after heard me play. And he said, Hey, would you like to play on Broadway? And I was like, Sure. I didn't really know much about musicals. I was all orchestral. I want an orchestra job, you know. So he introduced me to a trumpet player named Wilmer Wise, who was an amazing freelance trumpet player, played with Baltimore Symphony, one of the first African-American trumpeters to play in a symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. He hooked me up. We were doing Into the Woods, and it's a one trumpet show. And he, he told me that, you know, he gave me the tape and the music, and I went in, and I, you have to sit next to him and watch him play it. 
and then you study it and you go in and you play the show and you get uh, designated as a sub to go on the sub list. And I was designated and he was calling me on a regular basis to play a Broadway show while I'm at Juilliard. And there was the, the paycheck thing. I was like, wow, I'm actually, and it's fun. You know, it was just fun yeah. to meet yeah. musicians and be thrown in the fire and just be prepared. And I was still going to my practice room every morning at seven with goals, you know, tonguing today, legato here, loud. So I was just doing that like massive notes. I'm a, still a massive note taker. Um, and then the last, my last three summers at Juilliard, I did five years at Juilliard. So it's a total of eight years of school. Um, I did Tango with the Tango with Music Center the last three summers um, that I was at Juilliard. And because of Leonard Bernstein, because we had the opportunity to play uh, with Maestro Leonard Bernstein. So, and what a treat that was to, to oh. get to know him. Hi, that's my wife, Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hi, sorry. <laughs> you look Hi, good. Uh, <laughs> um, Wait, that is su such an inspiring story. I mean, I, 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 my path was a little different and I had <laughs> similar kinds of goals and in, like encounters as a musician. Uh, I was in college as a science and math major and then I got a gig playing at the Sydney Opera House and I dropped out of my degree because I had, I, I experienced this extraordinary excitement of playing with orchestral musicians. I mean, I made a list too, but it didn't include getting up at seven o'clock in the morning, <laughs> unfortunately, but that's, that's another story. But maybe uh, you just mentioned uh, playing with uh, Leonard Bernstein in, the, in that legendary um last performance of Copeland's Third Symphony. Could we maybe watch a little bit of it, uh, of the rehearsal? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So yeah, this was the, th the third summer. And usually you do two summers at Tanglewood, but they invited me back for a third summer because the orchestra was going to go on a European tour performing Copeland's Third Symphony with Bernstein conducting. And unfortunately, he was really ill. Yes. Like we, we performed that Copeland Nine. It's still probably the best performance I've ever taken part in. He's holding on to the podium, he's turning blue, and we're just like, bah, 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 let's go, you know, like, and it was absolutely incredible. And soon after that concert, he canceled the tour and then he passed away like a couple months later. That was his second last concert in his second life. Second last one. I think he did a Beethoven 7 the following he did Beethoven Beethoven 7th in, uh, at the final, uh, the Kuzovitsky Memorial Concert at the end of Tanglewood. Yes. But what, what an incredible, oh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, just an incredible human being. He would come to our parties. He would hang out with us and dole out great advice. You know, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. my my four encounters with Bernstein were things I'll never forget. Never forget. Um, anyway, so let's let's listen to a little bit of uh, a rehearsal with Bernstein conducting uh, Tanglewood. At Tanglewood. And yeah. You can't see Wayne, but you can hear him. And then we'll just hear a, a little bit of the famous section of the, the final movement, which is includes the fanfare for the common man. So I'm going to share my screen and here we go. Let's. <laughs>
that's as good as I ever heard it. That end. Oh, God, I'm crying. Oh, oh um, man. Man. <laughs> no, the, the emotional energy that just is getting channeled through that is so incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. Uh, Wayne, tell us what was it like to work with? What was it like to be with Bernstein? Well, the level was just so high, you know, as you know, and you know, living in New York City, whenever he was conducting a New York Phil, or once in a while he would come in and conduct a Chicago Philharmonic, I was there. I never missed it. Um, yeah, so too. there was just yeah. you know that level of of musicianship, uh, respect, determination, yeah. honor to to just be in his presence. It was so incredible. So you know, playing that piece, rehearsing it was just like, let's go, you know, there's no excuses. The world could be blowing up as far as I'm concerned when we're playing with him and our job is to make music and do what he says. <laughs> yeah. So That's it was right. pretty amazing. Yeah. Look, let's hear a little bit more, a couple more minutes. This is from mm -hmm. the recording, uh, the, the iconic recording of Bernstein uh, doing Kaplan's Third Symphony with the New York Philharmonic. We'll just hear a little bit of the, uh, the fourth movement, the first couple of minutes. Uh, let me see if I can cue it up. I'm just going to share my screen again. And oh, give me a moment. Okay, here we go. Oh, magnificent. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, I, uh, my wife, Ava, and I had a first encounter with Bernstein in 1984, I think. And somebody got us tickets to a rehearsal of Mahler 2 
final rehearsal, dress rehearsal with uh, New York Phil and Jesse Norman and Barbara Hendricks were the two soloists. Oh boy, yes, all good. And oh boy. that was for me. It was a religious conversion experience. Yep. Uh, it affected me for the rest of my life. Pretty incredible uh, stuff. Never, Pretty amazing. Yeah, I we actually managed to smuggle ourselves in with the help of ushers to all four subscription concerts. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> yes. I've never, done never, never missed a Bernstein concert after that. So, correct. Look, Wayne, why, uh, we we first had you as a guest at Midco Symphony in 2011, I think. Correct. And you played the Tomasi Concerto. Uh, and I had fallen in love with the recording of Witten Masalas playing that piece. You know, the, I love the Frenchness of it. The uh, it's a very, it's, it's a, He's a wonderful composer. I, I found out that he was really... He was interested in music from Corsica, where he used to spend his uh, vacations, and actually Southeast Asia, you know, Cambodia and Laos. And um, and tell tell us a bit, a little about your relationship with this concerto. Well, yeah, the first person I heard play it was Winton. Yep. And basically, any Winton recording that came out in the uh, late '80s, early '90s, I just played it all the time and learned it with my headphones on without looking at any of the music. And when I heard this. It just felt so playable, so light, so much fun. Um, cup mutes, straight mutes, um, and that re that crazy repetitive figure that comes throughout the whole piece. Yeah, it's just so much fun to play. And I just, also, I, just it. I mean, certain yeah. pieces that you hear sometimes that you're like, eh, whatever. This piece was like, oh man, this is just an incredible work. Well, very, well, very challenging. Very challenging, incredible high notes, and yeah, right. I, I, uh, we, we just. I remember the the orchest orchestral part is quite tricky, in terms yeah. of just transparency and precision. And uh, I, I, you know, pulled out our recording, and I've got to say, I'm I'm very proud of Mid Coasts. Absolutely, uh, it was a great concert, and, and you know, it's rare that you get to play things twice too. So just to be yeah. able to get a yeah. second chance. But shall I play? Absolutely. Let's, Let's hear some hear. of it. Yeah. So this is this is uh oh do you remember the, the actual date of this? I know it was This was January two thousand eleven. Right, okay. So. so this is Wayne with a soloist Midco Symphony. And I think we're hearing it at the, the performance from the Franco Center. Right, I think not this is it. Not sure. Or maybe it's from Orion. Yeah, here we go. Oh, it's so beautiful.
That's oh wow! Movement. Yeah, that's so much fun to play. Just wonderful. Yeah, one of the most beautiful pieces. I mean, you know, it's not aggressive. A lot of times when you hear a trumpet concerto, there's always there's always this. Eh, let's play a fanfare, but this was just like. What? Oh, Blaine, I'm just so so blown away by the lyricism in your playing and the precision and the beautiful phrasing. And I've got to give a shout out to our, our percussion section as well. I don't know who was playing mallets, but whoever it was did a beautiful job, <clears> and. <throat> And some just beautiful playing in the strings and winds too. Yeah, yeah incredible orchestra. Absolutely wonderful. I, I, the Mid Midco Symphony, I've got to say, always rises to the occasion, and in the concert, in that last week or so, I've, I'm always amazed by the wonderful things that come out in the playing. Absolutely. But you lifted us up, Wayne. It was so much fun. So yeah. much fun. So, so Wayne, you you have you enjoy a really amazing career in New York City. Uh, uh, you do you have the Manhattan Brass Quintet. You do Broadway. You've played you play at the Met. Um, you've recorded with Prince. You've I mean the number of ac musical activities you do is it's it's a huge list. Can you tell us a little about that life and how how you sure. enjoy it. Um, my last year of Juilliard, they um, the Met had a one year position. Um, for trumpet and I auditioned and I won the one year position and wow I mean and I hadn't really had a lot of opera training 
Mm-hmm. Um, I just happened to really take the list seriously and learn yep. how everything sounds that I'm going to be playing. And yep. uh, it was incredible. Um, now, I didn't get the job permanently, and I wasn't aware that they were going to continue to hire me, you know, to play all the stage bands. I do all the Bohems, Aida's, Meister Singer, Tannhäuser, Turandots. Yep. Um, absolutely incredible performances. Never a dull moment at the Met. Um, and so that's been a lot of fun. Um, but at some point, I just got tired of um, practicing excerpts over and over again. And I realized, look, I'm in New York City and I'm playing with hundreds of musicians per year. Like, you know, doing once in a while doing a jazz gig with our quintet. You know, we're doing tours with our quintet. Um, we're playing graduations, um, playing with Orpheus, going on tour with Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, St. Luke's. Long Island Phil, principal trumpet of the Brooklyn Phil. It was just a constant, you know, being asked to play in a lot of different venues. And it's a crapshoot. You never know what you're going to do from year in and year out. But uh, are you doing a- American, you're, you're principal trumpet of American Composers Orchestra also. Yeah, that came a little bit later. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, that's incredible to just basically play contemporary music and some of the hardest stuff ever written for trumpet. Yeah. Yeah. And we're always up to the task. It's 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 that's been a really great run playing with American Composers Orchestra. So much fun. So, but that was you know uh, living in New York City, and it, the best part is that you know our uh, my mantra is this to entertain, to make people happy. You know, I remember playing Man of La Mancha, mm-hmm. and looking up in the audience and knowing that someone's going to be crying in the front row. You know, they're going to get their money's worth, you know, and, and, yeah. and that's what it's all about. And you go home and you're happy. You're not coming home kicking things and telling people how terrible it was. We're performers. We're performing. Right. You know, it's fun. I don't even call it a job. I know. I, I, I've i always loved being in the pit. I mean, I love, you know, with all the, the people doing the clothes and the machinery. and that's Crazy. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible world all of its own. Yeah, and nothing beat the first time I conducted South Pacific at Lincoln Center. What a blast to have a whole show in front of you. You know, I'm just trying, don't be in awe. Just make sure that you, you know, because I was <laughs> I didn't know you've done that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've conducted oh, that cool. on Broadway. And uh, yeah, it's, it was, it's, it's fun, you know. Oh, I have such nostalgia for those days, boy. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, all, all of uh, our freelance colleagues have had a tough year. It's been rough, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it'll come back. It'll come back slowly but surely. You know, it's I keep thinking. Back. I'm, of, I'm hoping it's going to be like the Roaring Twenties. It's going to come back big. Yeah. yeah. You know, those Broadway theaters yeah. where you sit like this because they want to get as many people in there as possible. It's going to take a while for people to be comfortable right. sitting that close to other people. Thank God for the vaccine. And, you know, um, it just, it'll come back. It has right. to. The, and wait, the, you're doing a lot of teaching as well at NYU and right. uh, schools in New Jersey. Uh, you, are you, uh, you're doing a lot of music, new music with people at NYU? Correct. Young well, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I am now the music director of the NYU orchestras, so I conduct the orchestras. And right now, what we're doing is we have a big room in a penthouse on the 12th floor of the education building with string players, mask six feet apart from each other, woodwinds, percussion, I mean, uh, percussion and piano and harp are all in this room. Woodwinds and brass are on a whole nother floor in separate rooms, headphones, mic, laptop, playing their parts along with, with, you know, and and, and in the room that I'm in conducting, there's a huge screen, so I get to see them. Um, So it's a very odd way to make music, Mm -hmm. but it's working and we just can't wait to get back to sitting next to each other and making music you know, uh, as a group, all in one room. It's going to be uh, huge. Wayne, tell us about composers you're doing. I mean, the last couple of right. years brought out in awareness. I mean, there are so many, I mean, so many composers who've been neglected, and there are so many composers who are responding to the to the to the light to the to the time we're in. You know. Uh, yes, um, I believe that um, you know composers like Jerry Mumford, Hale Stork. Um, I don't think. In chamber music, they haven't been, uh, they have a big presence in chamber music. In orchestra, not as much. Um, And I don't know why, other than they're just not big names. But still, the music is incredible. And we're doing, uh, right now at NYU, we're doing uh, two romances for viola uh, with Amadi, um, with Amadi, uh, formerly known as Amadi Hummings. Um, 
incredible African-American violist. And um, the piece is just so beautiful. Wow. Um, and we, wow. um, we did a Jesse Montgomery piece called Starburst, which is like a five minute, just, you know, incredible like fanfare for strings basically is what it is Thank you for telling me about this piece Wayne, because i programmed it with my orchestra at phillips extra academy we're doing it okay. starting uh, i've already got the music we're starting next week right absolutely uh, so there's a whole plethora of of yeah. great african-american uh classical music composers out there that you know we're getting the word out you know uh we're... did you know about george walker wayne yes i do i do Unfortunately, for the small amount of the the small chamber orchestra that I'm conducting, there he doesn't have anything that's written for that. Um, but yes, George Walker is incredible. absolutely amazing composer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely incredible. He's written some amazing, yeah, you know, sort of in the and uh, that period of composition. Incredible. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. definitely. So, so Wayne, tell us about your experience with Prince. Oh, Prince. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, there was a time in New York City where I was playing in a Prince cover band in the village. Gigs would start at midnight or 1 a.m. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was an incredible band. I, I went to a wedding with a friend in Pennsylvania, and this band was playing there, the wedding band. And I went up to him and said, man, you guys sound great. And he's like, well, um, um, we play in the, in the village. Come check us out. And I saw Prince on the flyer he handed me. I was like, Prince? You guys play Prince? And he's like, yeah. I said, I know every Prince tune he ever wrote. So he said, well, come join us. So we had a little following. The name of the band was Days of Wild, and we would play at the uh, the Red. Uh, oh God, why I can't? Why is it escaping me? In, in the village, anyway. Uh, uh, bitter End. That's it. The Bitter and End. We would play there and have a little following. And one day, the sax player shows up. His name is Pierre Andre, and he said, "Oh, Prince is looking for a horn section. He may need you. Can I have your number?" I'm like, "Yeah, right. Of course, <laughs> He's need me, right?" And then about a month or two later, I get a call. From somebody who works for Prince. He's like, we'd like you to come to Paisley Park in Minneapolis and play with Prince. And I'm like, sure. You know, <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, they flew us up, limo to a hotel, then limo to Paisley Park. And I'm going into Paisley Park, and there's the purple motorcycle from Purple Rain and the white Cadillac from Alphabet Street Video. And basically, we just went right on to the stage. The band was rehearsing. We rehearsed for five hours nonstop. Wow. And he's dictating. Wow dictating horn lines to us, music we didn't know, music we knew, different arrangements of tunes we knew. And I am always prepared. And I had manuscript paper about an hour and a half. And this is like, he didn't really tell us what we were doing, why we were doing it. But I had manuscript paper and I started writing it down because it's like, there's no way I'm going to remember any of this stuff. Um, and so we were done with rehearsing that day. And um, we went back to the hotel and about 11 p.m. Prince calls us and says, we want you to record some of the music that you rehearsed today. And all the music that he asked us to record were three new songs. Um, and so, thank God I wrote them down <laughs> and <laughs> recorded it. And then um, the ne next day, we had another rehearsal and said there might be an impromptu concert. And there was a concert that started at midnight um, that had a mile, a line a mile long outside of Paisley Park to get in. And he had just announced it like earlier that morning or something like that. So we played a concert with Prince. It was a three day affair. Absolutely incredible. We had a conversation with Prince about with uh, about Mahler. He had just uh, he just heard Mahler's Second Symphony with the total Mahler Mahler aficionado. Yeah, and he was just like you know yeah. he totally knew that stuff, and it was incredible. Introduced me to Kale. I never knew what Kale was, but he had a garden. He would feed us from his garden. So anyway, um, <laughs> the three day tour was over. We went back to New York City, and uh, about a half year later, I go to Tower Records. And I go to the print section, and there's a new CD, the new print CD, New Power of Soul. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I'm on this. And I see the three tunes that we recorded. And I was like, and I opened the CD in the store. I didn't care. I was like, I'm going to open it. And I looked at one of the tunes, no name. I'm like, he didn't put my name on it? And then there was a tune called When You Love Somebody in there. He put our name on it. And I was like, okay, I'm done. Someone could shoot me right now. I'm fine. My life is it's complete, you know, it was pretty amazing. And actually, if you don't mind, I, I can play a little bit of that song. Let's hear it. For Let's you. Hear it, please. How can we not yeah, hear it? So this is a tune called When You Love Somebody. And this was when Prince was doing a lot of things online and not trying to, you know, get record sales and go number one. He was just releasing his stuff with its own record label because he wanted control over everything that he did. So this is a tune called When You Love Somebody. I'll play a little bit of the beginning of it.
Oh. Yeah. And so I'll skip to the end when there's this really cool horn lick uh, that gets very involved and it starts about right here. Check this out. Pound, stop, yeah, cause the brother getting down here lately. So that's the song. And oh, man, I mean, I just oh. couldn't believe it. I was like, OK, um, you know, those moments that you have in your life that are just yep. great, just all around great moments. It's like, OK, I played with Prince and he used me and put my name on his recording. Those uh, are the moments, you. man. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. let's let's stop this. So, yeah, that's that was just one of those moments, you know, with Leonard Bernstein conducted playing under him and and Prince was like, oh, my Lord, this is really happening. So, uh, yeah. So I. I mean, I'm so proud of that moment. I'm so oh, proud of it. Incredible. Yeah. Great to share that with you. Um, so, Wayne, our, our most recent uh, wonderful experience of playing with you was in uh, January 2019. It's only only two years. Well, how long ago was that? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like eons ago with the, you know, what's gone on in between. But we did a, uh, a, a new piece that uh, we jointly uh, commissioned from Rich Shamaria, who is your colleague at uh, NYU and just an amazing composer. Uh, Rich is a, teaches jazz composition. Could you tell us about Rich and and the, and his and his music? Yeah, I first met Rich Shamaria through Lou Soloff, who was an amazing trumpet player. He played with Blood, Sweat, and Tears and Gil. A legendary trumpet player, absolutely. And he joined our quintet, Manhattan Brass. And uh, Rich uh, wrote some arrangements for us to perform. They were challenging. They were beautiful. They were fun to play. And um, and so when I uh, took over as the I took over as the department, the head of the brass department at NYU, um, I found out that Rich was on the faculty there. He's the jazz compos composer composition department. And um, and I said, listen, man, you want to write write a concerto for me? Um, I have this opportunity that I could, we could just premiere it up in Maine. They've asked me to play something and um, this would be great if you could just write this three movement piece. And he did. And it was absolutely incredible. I mean, it's just so, it's so me, like what he wrote. He so, somehow yeah. knew me from playing in a quintet and that's what a great composer does. Yeah. You're and, writing and a piece. It's yeah. such an original musical language. And yeah. I thought, okay, I thought when you told me about it, we're going to hear a kind of jazz concerto. Right, but yeah. this this is not a typical jazz concerto. This is right. a it's out of his inner ear, and it's in a very original voice. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. So let's just play just a little bit of it. Okay. Um, and we're playing a piece now at NYU called uh, "Variations on a Theme" by Wayne Shorter that uh, he wrote that has Chris Potter playing saxophone. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see where is it? Oh, here it is, Shamaria Concerto. Let's just do that right here. Let's go. Okay, it's not playing. Why is it not playing? Go. <laughs> it's not playing. <laughs> oh, man. It's there, right? You see it? I see it. Yeah. Not sure why it's not playing. Oh, boy. Okay, shall I play it? Yeah, yeah, you play it. Okay, hang on. So you got, you got to unshare, and then I will... Right, yes, absolutely. That was strange. Okay, let me see if I can find it. Uh, there it was there so yeah and he also uh because we are at we're using a smaller chamber orchestra at nyu rich shamaria also arranged a version of bolero uh for the orchestra which is going to be a lot of fun wow again. amazing i want to hear that well this okay. is the concerto for trumpet by rich shamaria so okay here bolero. we go let me just make sure i've got the right file and off we go You hearing it? Absolutely. Got this got the score in front of me. <laughs> yeah, 
as you should. <laughs> Nicely in tune. It's beautiful. that good? Wonderful. Yeah. Fantastic. Beautiful. Okay, hang on a sec. Just got to work out how to find... How to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just press that red button at the top left and I think it'll stop. Where the hell is it? Hang on a sec. Can you hear that still or not? Yeah, it's still going. Can you go back to share. I think I found it. Okay. There you go. All right. Awesome. All right. I've got to say, th this piece is, uh, I hope that it gets more performances because I think it's a fabulous piece. Absolutely. I mean, the uh, the writing, the, the blending of wind textures and string, it's fantastic. Yes. Totally yeah. agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And well, so Wayne, I think. I think that's going to tie it up. I, I have completed my beer, uh, <laughs> and it was really delicious. So I think I'm going to, after we finish our, our Facebook session, I think I'm going to start another one up. Um, but this has been a really great pleasure. And fun, uh, we're man. looking forward to welcoming you back, back as both conductor and multiple soloist. 
Yeah, it's going to be fun. A little and, bit of Mozart next... on piano and Haydn on trumpet. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to hear you play piano, right? Yes, absolutely. That'll, yeah. that'll be absolutely incredible. <laughs> yeah, and you'll be conducting as well, which will be fabulous for the orchestra. So yeah, we'll get... I've always, always wanted to do that. I've never done that before, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so very much. It's been absolutely fabulous to have you as a guest. Uh, we're so looking forward to welcoming you back as uh, not only soloist and conductor, but as friend of the orchestra. Yeah, uh, I love I love the Mid Coast Symphony. Uh, the musicians are incredible, um, very respectful, and just great players. And it's you know, and it's fun for them too. I keep using the word fun, but they always seem to just really enjoy what they're doing. Nobody's complaining, and they love you. And that's what's important, you know. They like they love their music director. So well, yeah. thank thank you very much. I love them too. And I'm just so thrilled to have had a chance to revisit these performances we did together. Yes. Um, I don't know about you, but I almost I always avoid listening to my recordings for about six months after I've <laughs> made them. And it's a real pleasure to hear these these pieces. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you so much, Wayne. Rowan, it's been my pleasure, man. So much fun. All right, so we'll Take see care. you soon. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Enjoy your weekend. And remember to turn your clocks ahead tonight at 2 a.m. By one hour. Yeah, Into... don't forget. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, good night, everyone. Peace, everybody.